Hey guys, Andy Robertson here with CQE Academy and I'm so incredibly excited for this week's video. We are about to cover one of the brand new topics that is just being added to the CQE Body of Knowledge. Remember, if you haven't heard, the Body of Knowledge is being updated here in October of 2022, which is right around the corner. And so I thought this, was, this would be perfect timing to talk about one of these new concepts, which is all about risk-based thinking in the quality auditing process. Remember, risk management itself is a huge update to the body of knowledge, and this idea of risk can also be incorporated into the way we plan, execute, and follow up on our audits, and that's exactly what I wanna talk about today. So let's head over to the computer and get started. All right, let's start. I always love to start these discussions by talking about context. So if you're not familiar, the CQE body of knowledge is changing and that's going into effect here in October of 2022, which is right around the corner. And I wanted to shoot a video to help people who are preparing for that future CQ exam by talking about one of what I think is one of the most important changes to the body of knowledge, which is all about including risk-based thinking in auditing, right? Auditing is one of these important concepts in the CQE body of knowledge. Now, if you look at the body of knowledge itself, it's a big concept. There's a lot of topics, types of audits, roles and responsibilities, audit planning and implementation, audit follow-up, right? And if you look at the change, it's three simple words, including assessing risk. Now, even though that change is, is minor in terms of the number of words it added, right? It's only three three words. It's a really important change to the way we should be thinking about auditing. And so that's why I wanted to shoot this video today to show you how to include risk-based thinking in auditing. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so before we get into actually how to incorporate risk into the audit process, I want to give you some background and some context. So in 2015, as most of you know, the, the ISO standard for, for our quality management system, ISO 9001, was revised. And one of the major aspects of that revision was this idea of risk-based thinking. And so this idea of risk-based thinking applies to all areas of the quality system, including auditing. So in 2018, the ISO standard for auditing, ISO 19011, was updated. And one of the major updates to that ISO standard was this idea of risk-based thinking. Okay, And what the standard says is that the concept of risk, this is really important, the concept of risk should substantively, and I hope I pronounced that right, should substantively influence the planning execution and reporting of audits, okay? Now, before we get into the actual process, I wanna talk about why. Why is this such an important, or why is this such a major update to both the ISO standard and the CQE body knowledge? First of all, audits, right? This, and this, this comes directly from the standard. Audits should be focused on matters of significance for the audit client. And those matters of significance inherently have some fundamental element of risk to it. So this idea of significance and risk, to me, are synonyms, right? A matter of significance, something that the, the client inherently cares about, has some element of risk. The second thing that the standard says, and this is quite frankly, is the bottom line. The value of an audit, the audit value increases when we address high risk issues. We want to make auditing as valuable as possible. And one of the ways we can do that is to make sure we're focusing and addressing high risk issues. Now, those high risk issues have a relationship back to matters of significance, right? A, a client or a business owner should fundamentally care about high risk issues, and that should become a matter of significance. And so that's why having or taking a risk-based approach in auditing will fundamentally make your, your audits more valuable. Now, I want to focus, right, the bulk of this uh, this lecture, this, this presentation today is all about how you can incorporate risk-based thinking or the concept of risk into those three major phases of an audit, right? And so the three major phases is audit planning, audit execution, and audit reporting. And so that's what I'm going to do now. I want to switch gears and, and talk about how you should be incorporating risk into those three phases. Let's start with risk-based thinking in audit planning. So when you're planning an audit, one of the most common and important tools that you can create as part of that audit preparation is an audit plan, right? It's the who, what, when, where, and why. Now, I'm not going to go into detail about the audit plan because we cover that in, in the course, the CQE Masterclass. What I want to do now, though, is talk about how you can and should be incorporating risk into the audit planning process. First of all, and this comes directly from the standard, your priority 
in terms of your, your allocating resources and time and methods should be given to matters in a management system with inherently high risk and lower levels of performance. When you're defining the scope of an audit, right? When you're thinking about how you're going to, how you're going to spend your time, right? When you think about the time of an audit, the duration of an audit and how much time you're going to spend on each topic, you should be prioritizing topics that have inherently high risk and lower levels of performance. Now, what does that look like in the real world? So, Areas with inherently higher risk, right, can't be easily defined because it depends on your industry and it depends on the company. But lower levels of performance is easy to define. If you're auditing, let's say, a vendor, you're doing a supplier quality audit, and they have a history of a particular nonconformance or, or their past audits have particularly not gone well in, let's say, the area of CAPA. That's an area of poor performance, right? And inherently, you could also argue that CAPA has an inherently higher risk. If you're not addressing, right, if you're ineffective in the way you address issues, right, the way you solve problems, that can inherently be risky for your business, right? We want to be good at solving problems, right? And so when you're structuring your audit, you can give priority to topics that have inherently high risk or inherently low performance levels historically over time. The other way that you can incorporate risk-based thinking into audit planning is the use of audit methods. Now, during COVID, this right, this was very easy. We didn't want to be on site. We wanted to audit remotely. So we wanted to mitigate risk and do remote audits, right? Because we were we were using risk-based thinking. The other way you can use this, and we'll talk about this in a second when we talk about audit execution, is the actual auditing techniques that you use. Some of them have inherently more risk than others, and we'll talk about that here in a second. The other aspect, and I absolutely love this, is that when you're thinking about audit planning, don't forget about risk management, right? If you're planning for an audit, make sure to request and plan to audit the way a company manages risk, right? Ask for, request relevant information on risks that the organization has identified and how they are being addressed. We want to plan for and think about risk management when we're planning an audit, right? That's something you could absolutely consider in the scope of your audit. And then lastly, is how your audit might introduce new risks, right? And I think the classic example of this is, let's say you're auditing a, a manufacturing environment and you want to go on a production tour. There might be some inherent risks with you getting out on the production floor. And so you should you should plan for those and you should try to mitigate those, right? You should mitigate those risks while you're planning for the audit, right? What PPE do I need to wear? What PPE do I need to bring? And what parts of the facility can I see and can I not see because of the inherent risk associated with that tour? Think about, again, how your audit might introduce new risks to the business or to the client that you're auditing. Okay, let's switch gears now and talk about risk-based thinking in audit execution. So when you're executing an audit, there are four, I'll call them primary techniques that you can use to collect data, right? So here in audit execution, what we're doing is we're collecting evidence, we're collecting data to demonstrate compliance or non-compliance to whatever audit criteria it is that we're, that we're auditing against. And there's different ways that you can collect data and collect evidence, examining records, interviewing folks, collecting physical evidence or making observations on the production floor. Now, we go into way more detail in this into the course. And what I want to talk about now is I want to emphasize this idea that auditing is inherently a sampling activity, right? We talk about acceptance sampling. We talk about uh, hypothesis testing or any sort of inferential statistics. What we're doing in an audit is we're taking a sample and we're using that sample to make inferences about a population. And because we're only taking a sample, there is an inherent risk that our evidence may not be representative of the population. Our conclusion in the audit may not be accurate. And so there's two types of errors we can make, and this is analogous to acceptance sampling. The first type of error that you might make in an audit is that you might come to a negative conclusion, right? You might find a negative result when in fact the system that you're auditing is in fact in a satisfactory condition, right? That's called a type one error. That's analogous to producer's risk in acceptance sampling. You might reject good product, right? That's kind of the analogy here. So as a result of the sampling nature of auditing, you might come to a negative conclusion about a quality system or a process when in fact that system is in actuality satisfactory. The second type of error that you have to be aware of is this idea of consumer's risk. You might find a positive result, right? Your audit conclusion might be positive when in fact the reality is that the process or the system that you're auditing is in fact broken. And that's consumer's risk. In acceptance sampling, you might accept bad product, right? That's a type two error. And so when you think about these two types of risks, one of the best things that you can do 
is take more samples. Now, I say samples, but that could be anything. That could be time. It could be more interviews. It could be more physical evidence. Essentially, you want to focus your time on inherently high-risk activities. The way you mitigate a type 1 error and the type 2 error is to essentially collect more evidence and focus on areas or topics that have inherently high risk. And again, you can mitigate these risks by simply just spending more time and focusing on high risk areas. So that's kind of how you apply risk-based thinking in audit execution. Now let's talk about audit reporting and follow-up. So at the end of an audit, what you're going to write is an audit report. And in that audit report are these things called audit findings. Okay. And I want to make sure you understand how your audit report and these audit findings fall into this concept of risk management. So an audit finding is inherently, or it's synonymous with the idea of risk identification. You have uncovered or identified a risk to the business, right? That's, that's what an audit finding is. Now, when you are, when you're describing that audit finding, there's a bunch of things you need to talk about. And of course we cover all that in the course. The thing I want to highlight today, right? Physically highlight is this idea of classifying your, your findings, right? When you give an organization or you give a client a finding, you're usually going to classify that finding as minor, major, or critical, right? Those are the three kind of most commonly used terms for an audit classification. And what you're doing by classifying that audit finding is you're doing risk analysis. You're fundamentally quantifying the risk level associated with the risk that you've identified. Now, the reason that that's important is because the level of audit follow-up, everything you do in terms of writing the report and following up and you know do, coming back to verify the corrective actions should all be based on risk, right? The thoroughness of the corrective action that the auditee or the client puts forward should be based on risk. The timeliness of the corrective actions and your follow-up should be based on risk. If you hand out a, a, an audit report that has multiple critical findings, right, the timeliness of your follow-up, you might want to come back in four weeks or six weeks or, or eight weeks. You might want to change the timeliness of your follow-up. You also should change the expectations you have for thoroughness. If you find a critical observation, right, the depth of that corrective action should be commensurate with the level of risk. And so as you're writing audit reports and you're, you're classifying your findings, think about how that impacts your level of follow-up, again, in terms of kappa thoroughness and kappa timeliness. And that is how you incorporate risk-based thinking into those three phases of auditing, which include planning, execution, and reporting. By the way, if you are preparing for the, the CQE exam, head on over to cqeacademy.com. I have a ton of free stuff that will help you on your CQE journey. Practice exams, a ton of free practice exams, study guides, cheat sheets, right? I've got this I've got this exam day cheat sheet. You can print it off, bring it into the exam. It's got every equation on the exam that you need to know. I've got all sorts of tips, advice, free courses, just a ton of stuff that will help you on your journey to become a CQE. I would love to help you out. I would love to help you grow. So head on over there and sign up. It's completely free. Get all that free stuff. And again, I would love to help you on your journey to become a CQE. If you love this video, do me a favor, hit that like button so that other people just like you can find the same content. And again, if you want to stay on that journey to, to become a CQE, hit that subscribe button. I'm going to be publishing videos regularly. And that way, as I do, you get notified and you can stay on that journey and become a CQE. That is it for me. Again, I hope you loved it and I will see you in the future. Thanks so much.